A huge thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Hi everyone, Path here, and in this video I want to talk about degeneracy pressure, a quantum mechanical effect that supports stars and stops them from collapsing in on themselves. We'll look at exactly how degeneracy pressure prevents the collapse of stars, at least temporarily, and then look at the fairly basic mathematics behind degeneracy pressure and how it can be explained using quantum physics. So if you enjoyed this video, then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Let's get into it. During the life cycle of a standard main sequence star like our sun, there are two major competing forces. One is the force of gravity, which is attractive in nature. This means that all the little particles making up the star will attract each other and tend to cause the star to get smaller and smaller or to collapse in on its center. The reason this doesn't happen though is because in a main sequence star there are also outward forces being exerted, one of which is due to the fact that nuclear fusion is happening in its core. This process, where hydrogen atoms fuse together to form helium, releases a lot of energy. As a result, the star reaches a size where the inward forces balance the outward forces and neither overcomes the other one. And this continues for a while until the hydrogen in the star runs out because it's all fused to form helium. We're talking about specifically the core of the star here. But of course, helium can also undergo nuclear fusion to form heavier elements. But the point is that nuclear fusion keeps on going until all of the fuel in the star runs out and forms elements so heavy that these fusing together is no longer energetically possible. At this point, the star is well out of its main sequence stage and even its red giant stage. What's left is a white dwarf. The inward acting gravitational forces have caused it to collapse and some of the outer layers have been shed so we're left with a small but dense object. But here's an interesting question. Why is this star this size? It's smaller than before, sure, but why isn't it collapsing down even further? After all, there's no outward pressure from nuclear fusion in the core, right? Well, let's remember that squashing the same amount of stuff into a smaller volume increases the density of the object that we're considering and we're basically pushing all the atoms in the star closer and closer together. Because stars are large enough, they will often be able to overcome the electrostatic repulsion these particles will feel because of the fact that they are charged objects, so stars can usually overcome this force. But something is stopping the star from collapsing even further, and that something is a quantum mechanical effect called degeneracy pressure. To understand it, let's recall a couple of important ideas in quantum mechanics, starting from the very beginning. Let's recall that any quantum system we happen to be studying, say for example a single electron, can be described by a wave function. This is just a mathematical function that contains all the information we can know about our electron. One such piece of information is the position of our electron in space. The wave function shows, in this case, the electron is most likely to be found in these positions and less likely to be found here, for example. We won't go into too much detail about this here, but I have a video on wave functions if you'd like to find out more. Check it out up here if you're interested. Things become much more interesting when we consider multiple electrons, however. Firstly, in quantum mechanics, a multi-particle system like this one can actually be described by a single wave function. The wave function no longer looks as simple as the one we were looking at earlier because we need to be able to calculate the probability of finding one electron at one point in space and another electron at another point in space. So drawing out the wave function on a single axis is relatively tricky, but there is a mathematical function that we can represent this as. The point is that we could plug in possible positions of our electrons and find out how likely we are to find them in those positions. That's what the wave function of a multi-electron system would allow us to calculate. Now, an interesting thing about electrons, which is also true for many other kinds of particle, is that they are indistinguishable from each other. They all have the exact same mass, same charge, and other such properties as each other. This results in some very interesting properties of electrons. For one, the wave functions of indistinguishable particles can fall into two different categories. Firstly, the wave function could be 
symmetric, meaning if we were to look at a system of lots of these particles and swap two of them, the wave function actually stays the same as it was before. It doesn't change. This type of particle is known as a boson. The other possibility is that the wave function is anti-symmetric. This means that when we swap two particles, the wave function actually becomes negative of what it was before. So every time we swap a pair of particles, the wave function becomes negative of the previous version. This type of particle is known as a fermion, and electrons are fermions. Now, all of this sounds a little bit strange, especially the fact that this behavior is directly related to the fact that the particles are identical. So if you want to find out more about this, then check out this video up here. But for our purposes, all we care about is that electrons, which are fermions, have an anti-symmetric wave function. Also worth noting is that an electronic wave function can be broken up into a spin part, which essentially determines whether the electron is in the spin up or spin down state, and an orbital part, which determines which energy level or orbital it's in. Let's understand this second part a little bit better. We may be familiar with the idea that in an atom, an electron can occupy one of a fixed set of energy levels. And within each energy level, there are a set of orbitals. The first energy level only has one orbital. The second energy level has one that is just like the first level and then three more orbitals. And the next energy level has nine orbitals and so on and so forth. Each orbital can only contain two electrons, one spin up and one spin down. This is literally because an electron system's wave function has to be anti-symmetric. What this means is that two electrons cannot have exactly the same spin state and the same orbital state at the same time. Because if that were the case, then swapping these electrons would still result in the same wave function. And this cannot happen, as this is a boson wave function, not a fermion one. If these two things are different for two electrons, however, then swapping them would allow us to turn the wave function negative. So that works for fermions. So what this tells us is that if two electrons have to be in the same orbital state, then they must be in different spin states. And since there are only two possible spin states, each orbital can only hold two electrons. And therefore each shell can only hold the number of orbitals it has times two electrons in it. Now it's worth noting that orbitals have something to do with the spatial position of these electrons in these atoms. We can see that the first shell, which is the lowest in energy, is on average closer to the nucleus of the atom. The second shell with high energy has all its orbitals that are slightly further away. And then the next shell is slightly further away still. All of this is a bit hand wavy and the exact details would need a full video to discuss. But the point is that orbital states are roughly related to the positions of electrons in space and where we can actually find these electrons in space. Now, let's go back to our white dwarf. Within a white dwarf, the electronic energy levels aren't quite like that in an atom, but the point is that each allowed quantum orbital state corresponds to some amount of energy, and we can draw a very simplified energy level diagram showing all the allowed states that electrons can occupy in the white dwarf. The energy levels aren't necessarily equally spaced, but that's how we're drawing them here just for simplicity. And each quantum state can have two electrons as we've already seen. So we can see that in a system that has a very, very large number of electrons, we will get to a point where eventually all the electrons are occupying the lowest possible energy levels if we compress the star smaller and smaller. They cannot go any lower because the lower energy levels are already occupied. The most energetic electrons up here somewhere have some large amount of energy that cannot necessarily be overcome by gravity. Another way to look at this, which is a bit less scientifically ideal, but a bit more easy to visualize, is that each of these states, as we've seen before, corresponds to a small chunk of space. Remember, each quantum state can correspond to where the electrons in it can be found in space. So all these electrons cannot occupy the same bit of space. They cannot all collapse down into the same region. They have to be spread out over a larger region of space. This is what creates the degeneracy pressure that opposes gravitational collapse. And it's worth noting that this has nothing 
to do with the electrostatic repulsion that electrons experience because they're negatively charged. Of course, that exists as well, but we haven't even accounted for that. Even if electrons didn't have to deal with their repulsion because they're all negatively charged particles, there would still be this degeneracy pressure that prevents a full collapse of the white dwarf because these electrons are fermions. Now, at very, very large masses, the gravitational collapse force is big enough to overcome this degeneracy pressure outward force by some interesting means, but I want to discuss that in a separate video. After all, we've just seen how quantum mechanical effects can be used to literally hold up stars from collapsing in on themselves completely. Now, before we finish up, I want to take a moment to thank the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. Squarespace gives you a beautiful, powerful online platform from which to create your website. You can build a community on your Squarespace website with a fully integrated commenting system that supports threaded comments, replies, and likes. On top of that, you can easily display posts from your social profiles on your website. You can also connect with your audience and generate revenue through gated members-only content. You can manage your members, send email communications, and leverage audience insights as well, all on one easy-to-use platform. So if you're looking to very easily create a crisp, nice-looking website, then head over to squarespace.com forward slash path G to get a free trial and to save 10% on your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com forward slash path G. Huge thanks to Squarespace once again for sponsoring this video. And with all of that being said, I'm going to finish up here. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Check out my merch linked below. It features a quantum dice design based on a famous quote from Albert Einstein. I'd like to thank all of my Giga patrons as well as all of my other patrons over on my Patreon page, which is linked down below as well if you'd like to support me on there. Let me know if there's anything we've discussed in this video that isn't quite clear enough and we'll try and clarify in the comments. And with that being said, thank you so much for watching and I will see you very soon.